with him out on the back deck of my home. And it was awesome to see the shimmering beauty and glory of Almighty God as He revealed Himself to me. And He, he said, observe all the glory and observe all my splendor. Look at everything that I have made. I am displaying my glory before you. It is, all, it is me who is all-powerful. And it is me who gives strength to you. And as I poured my heart out to God over my issue that I had, He said, get up from where you're at. He said, go inside. And He said, you take your daily Bible study and you read, I want to speak to you. And there in the book of Daniel, the 10th chapter. I want you to read it for yourself today sometime. There Daniel acknowledged that the angel of God reached down and he put his hand on him. And he told him, stand up. Stand up. I will strengthen you. Folks, God wants to speak to us today. God wants to strengthen us today in every part of our life. No matter what affliction, no matter what problem. He wants to speak to you. And the way He speaks to you and I is through His Word. And God is speaking to His church. He's speaking to us at large. He's speaking to me as your pastor, as as the leader of this fellowship. He's saying, listen, there comes times when I have to bring the presence of brokenness into your life. Because I want you broken before me. There are times I've got to bring you to the place where you are humble before me. Because I love those who are of broken heart and a contrite, humble spirit. That's where God wants us. Not in a pitiful state, but in that state of where we know we have total dependency upon Him. He is our strength. He is our rock. He is our fortress. In keeping the vision that God has given us as a church, we're in the second part of this. And you can go home today and you can take your syllabus of where you went through discovering membership and realize that there are places in this vision, we've lost vision as a church. And God sometimes has to bring a church to a place of brokenness and humility for that church to realize, look, I'm losing my focus. I've lost my passion for the vision that God has given us as a people. In Nehemiah, the second chapter, verses 11 through 18, God revealed to Nehemiah the disgrace that had come upon Judah because it wasn't a fortress anymore for the Lord. It wasn't a place that was protected from the walls, from the, from the enemy from coming into the walls. And as we read in the book of Nehemiah, the second chapter, beginning in verse 11, we're going to see where God has spoken to this man and said, Listen, go and observe, look and see the decay of Judah, of my people Israel. I want it built back. I I don't want it to be a disgrace anymore among the nations, but I want it to rise up. That it may bring glory to my name. Looking in the verse 11, we begin to read here. He says, So I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. Then I rose in the night and a few men with me. I told no one what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem, nor was there any animal with me except the one on which I rode. And I went out by night through the valley gate to the serpent well and the refuge gate and viewed the walls of Jerusalem which were broken down and its gates, which were burned with fire. When I went to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal under me to pass. So I went up in the night by the valley and viewed the wall. When I turned back and entered by the valley gate and so returned. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I had done. I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, or the others who did the work. Then I said to them, You see the distress that we are in now, how in Jerusalem lies waste, and its gates are burned with fire. Come and let us build the wall of Jerusalem, that we may no longer be a reproach. And I told them of the hand of my God, which had been good upon me, 
and also of the king's words which he had spoken to me. So they said, Let us rise up and build. Then they set their hand to do this good work. In keeping with the vision that, and direction that God has given this church, we've committed ourselves through the years to being a people and their pastor in a long-term relationship of love and trust doing ministry together. I hope that you know I love you. I hope you know I love you. And I know that you love me. But you know what? We're here for a purpose. And that purpose is to do ministry together. That purpose isn't just to get warm, fuzzy feelings. Although those warm, fuzzy feelings that are good should cause us to realize this is where we build each other up. This is where we build up the body of Christ. This is where we build up our confidence in the Word of God for the purpose of doing ministry, of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, of coming and being equipped. And as last I shared last week, of becoming fruitful. That's what fruitfulness is. It's doing ministry together. And it has everything to do with a matter of the heart. That is what God has placed in the heart of a pastor and in the hearts of the people of His church in order to do ministry together. We've got to realize this. There's got to be a oneness of heart, mind, and spirit. And with these three in harmony, all together with each other, God, God can accomplish so much. He can accomplish so much. We've embraced it. We realize this is what God has called us to. But you know, sometimes along the way, we lose sight of what it is that we're here for. And we kind of get distracted by many different things in life. But God has called us together to love one another and to love Him. To love Him with all our heart, with all our soul, and all our spirit and mind. And if we will do this toward Him, He said we are to do this toward one another. That's what brings us together to do ministry. In the book of 2 Corinthians, the 8th chapter, verse 16, he says, I thank God who put into the heart of Titus the same concern I have for you. You see, what's in your heart needs to be in my heart. What's in my heart needs to be in your heart. That which is from God. Our hearts ought to pour. Our hearts ought to cry out for those that don't know Jesus Christ. You may say, well, I, I'm not some kind of prophet. I'm not some kind of teacher. I'm not some kind of preacher. But you are a witness. And you know how you're a witness? You're a witness of what you've experienced personally, personally in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Let me ask you something. Has Jesus Christ come into your heart and life? Did Jesus Christ save your soul? All right, then you've got something to tell. You've got something to tell. You can be that witness. And together, we can share our personal testimony. Not only about, of what Jesus Christ has done for us, but what He can do for others. You know the best days of this relationship? It wasn't in the first year that I was here. It has come through years of building love and trust through a continuous relationship of fellowship and hard work with each other. Now, investing this love that we have for one another in kingdom purposes, it takes courage. It takes compassion. And it takes commitment. You know, you wonder sometimes... I see Matt back here. Matt, you ever been thrown off a horse? A bunch. Yeah, you've been thrown off a horse a bunch. Did that stop you from getting on a horse? Apparently not because you've been thrown off a bunch. And you know what? I guarantee you, he is more committed to breaking a stubborn horse than he is one that will yield to his training. 
I'm going to teach that horse. I'm going to teach him. I'm going to train him. I'm going to show him. And he is going to become the best horse. Usually, you know what? The most stubborn horse winds up being the best horse. Because once he's trained, he's just as stubborn about his training and the way he was trained. As a matter of fact, if you don't get out there and work with him every day, that stubborn horse that you broke, that you trained, he'll throw you again because you didn't come out there the day before and work with him now, won't he? He sure will. Now, let me ask you something. You and I, we can't put ourselves in the position of the rider in this story. We've got to put ourselves in the position of the horse. The position of the horse. Sometimes we're the rear end of the horse. Sometimes we're the head of the horse. You have to figure what part of the anatomy you are. That was good. I like that. It just came out. I couldn't help it. But that's us. That's us. God's got to bring sometimes some of the most some of the most painful lessons to show us, I want you to turn and yield to me this way. I want you to turn and yield that way. You know, that's why the bridle is in that horse's mouth. That's why that bit is there. Because if you want him to turn, he won't turn. You just bear down on that tongue some more. Sooner or later, you're going to get his attention. Sooner or later, he's going to turn. Sometimes the pain has got to come. We don't know what the vehicle is. I do. But he will use it to bring brokenness, humility. For you and I to get, to get our vision on him. To get his perspective. And to yield and to look to him. And to go where he's leading. To be the people he's called us to be. Now looking at your relationship with God and with this church. Let me ask you a question. Would you be able to say that in our years together here with this people, that your capacity to love and fellowship with this people has increased? Or has it diminished? You see, as the Lord draws us together and closer together, it ought to be increasing. The only way it would decrease is for us to unplug, is for us to dislocate, and then become disenchanted. You know, let me tell you something. Not everything in church is going to please you. And not everything is going to make you happy. What happens in church is supposed to bring glory and honor and praise to Almighty God. But our attitude toward Him has everything to do with Him receiving glory, honor, and praise. Sometimes He's got to bear down on the bit. Sometimes we've got to become uncomfortable. Sometimes we're not going to be happy. God never meant for you and I to be happy. As Mike Carpenter says, you can buy yourself some happiness. You got some money, you can buy some happy. But as soon as that wears out, and as soon as the money's gone, happy's gone. But there is joy in the Lord. There is joy in the Lord. There is love in His Spirit. There's hope in the knowledge of Him. There's a fountain that flows like a river from heaven. We sing about this. Now it's time more than to, to do more than just sing. It's time to embrace. It's time to wrap our hands and our minds around this. It's time that we develop a heart for ministry and be devoted to to it. Not just fall off when things don't feel good to us. But to wrap our fingers around it. In 1 Corinthians the 16th chapter verses 15 and 16. He says I urge you brethren. You know the household of Stephanus. That it is the first fruits of Achai. And that they have devoted themselves to the ministry of the saints. That you also submit to such. And to everyone who works and labors with us in doing ministry. Understand this. It was never meant for it to be a single-handed endeavor. Christ wasn't alone in ministry. 
Paul wasn't alone in ministry. And neither is anyone else to be alone in ministry. What you've got to realize is that submitting to one another, doing ministry together with one another, loving one another, fellowshipping with one another, witnessing with one another and to one another, it's not an undermining thing. It's not a maligning thing. It's not a manipulating thing where somebody else has control of you. Although we need to be under control of Almighty God. It's just humbling. It's, it's, it's humbly giving yourselves over to the leadership of the Holy Spirit of God and serving our living Lord, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I want you to notice in this Scripture here that Nehemiah went and he viewed the places in the walls that were broken down. There were places that needed to be mended. They needed repair. And you know what? There are places right here in the walls of this fellowship that are broken down. They're broken down and they're in need of repair. When you have a people that say, I love God and I love each other, and yet they say, I don't want to teach. I don't want to help. I don't want to instruct. I just, I want to go and I want to be fed. Let me tell you something. There are so many ways to be fed in this fellowship. There are so many opportunities that you can go and you can get food and you can get nourishment. All you've got to do is commit yourself to it and be devoted to it. To come and consume and to get all you need. There is a place and there is a purpose for everyone in this fellowship. No one is excluded if you're called into a relationship with Jesus Christ, as everybody reported a while ago, yes, I know Jesus Christ. Yes, I've been saved. Yes, I've come under His great salvation. There's a place for you. You see, if we don't repair these walls, we're going to become a disgrace. Not just to each other. Not just to each other. But an entire community. Let me ask you something. As Nehemiah went to every man that said, Yes, we will build. And he said, Go to your place. Go, go to where you live. And the wall that is there in front of you, begin your work there. Everyone in this fellowship has a place. And there's a portion of the wall where you live. In this place. And you work. And there's a place for you to begin that work. It's just a matter of obediently picking up one stone at a time. And putting it in its place. To build it up. So we don't become that reproach. So God can show you where you are of use. You know you find people all the time that are doing several different things. And they're trying to do their best to do all those things, but they can't do all of them well. You know why? Because they weren't meant to do that. God had called them for a purpose to build their section of the wall. But they're having to go over here and mend somebody else's section of the wall because they're not picking up and they're not putting in. I say this to encourage you, church. I say this to challenge you. I say this to charge you. Build your wall. Build your section of the wall. Will you stand in your place and repair your section of the wall, church? Nehemiah 4, 6 says this, So we built the wall, and the entire wall was joined up together to half its height. For the people had a mind to work. Nothing gets done Nothing gets accomplished unless those who are called to the work set their minds to do the work. God poured out His heart onto Nehemiah about the wall. And then Nehemiah went and inspected and he brought it to the attention of the people. And the people said, yes, yes. This is being poured into our hearts too to accomplish God's plan is God pouring into your heart and into your mind to repair 
your section of the wall. You see, what we've got to realize is what happens and why walls are broken down. These walls around the city were to offer refuge, security to the nation and to the people. It was to keep the enemy out, to keep them from coming in and frustrating, causing confusion and dilemma, to keep the people safe from attack. You know, we've got walls here, and we feel pretty good in here, don't we? Let me ask you something. If we were to take down the, all the security that we have here, take the doors off the front of the church and all the other doors off, throw them out there in the, in the yard, let me ask you something. Would you feel very secure then? You've heard this story. Shoot fire. I remember when I was a boy, we just sat there with a screen door last. We didn't have to worry about nobody coming in. You remember that? Oh, yeah. I can remember laying in front of that door so I could feel a cool breeze come across me. So I could sleep. You know, that latch didn't offer much security, but just to hear that click felt pretty good. Felt pretty good. What had happened here at Jerusalem? God had realized His people were vulnerable. He doesn't want us vulnerable. Do you realize that? God doesn't want you helpless. He doesn't want you hopeless. He does not want you fearful. That's the whole purpose of building this wall. Was for them to realize there is strength. There is strength and there is hope in the Lord God Almighty. You see, what had happened? The walls were broken down. The gates had been burned. The people had become lethargic. Apathetic. And there's a huge difference between being healthy and happy as opposed to being obese and lethargic. But God's people have a habit. God's people have a habit of doing this. Trying to link the two together in their thinking. In other words, they're thinking, all we want to do is be filled and satisfied and happy. You see, this is a dangerous mindset that will destroy the church. We must constantly be on our guard. You realize that when these men were building back their section of the wall, that they were told to keep their sword with them and be ready to fight the enemy because there were those who were opposed, other nations who were opposed to them building that wall back. You know why? Because they wanted Israel to continue to be the sucker, to be weak, to be vulnerable. For them to be able to come in and pilfer and pillage and do whatever they wanted to anytime they want to. God does not want us this way. He wants us to be a mighty fortress for His use. And the only way to do that is to protect us. And we have got to realize, here's what Nehemiah is saying to all the people. You've got to be willing to protect yourself. You've got to be willing to guard your own heart and your own mind and your own spirit and your own family and your own nation. And the only way to do that is for you to take responsibility and for you to realize what needs to be done. Children need to be in Sunday school. There needs to be teachers in Sunday school. This place is ready to equip. But you know what? Nehemiah couldn't make those people build that section of the wall. No one else can make you see or have the division or have the vision and the passion to do what God is calling us to do. But He will hold you accountable and He will hold you responsible for the neglect. Just as He will me. He will hold you responsible for that. So we've got to be constantly on our guard. Even while we're building. Even when our enemies don't seem to be attacking us. Understand this. We're not beyond the plots and the schemes 
of the evil one. Listen to this. Because if we're not vigilant, here's what's going to happen. We will go to sleep. He will sneak in. And I know this is grotesque, but He will slit our throat from ear to ear. He will. Jesus, Jesus spoke this to His disciples when He was facing the cross and facing death. When He came back to them time and time again and He found them sleeping. He said this in Luke twenty two forty six. He says, Then He said to them, this is Jesus, Why do you sleep? Rise and pray lest you enter into temptation. Let me ask you this. Have you fallen asleep on God? You see, Christ is making a tender appeal to His disciples here. And He's making that same appeal to you and I because they were in their weakness. And in their weakness, they were disobeying God and Jesus Christ at a very critical moment. A critical moment where Christ was fighting against His flesh to not fulfill the mission. Satan been tempting him time and time again. Don't do this. Appealing to his flesh. Don't do it. Don't sacrifice. Don't give it the time. Don't give it the effort. They're not worth it. All they want to do is kill you. All these guys are going to do is betray you. Walk away and leave you. Y'all going to like Mother's Day sermon. Because the women stayed with Jesus. Amen, women? All right. I ain't going to tell you no more. But have you fallen asleep? Have you fallen asleep? Is He making a tender appeal to you? Because we're in a very critical moment. Not just right now. But we're in a critical place. Always. Let me tell you something. You may think to yourself, I just don't have what it takes. You know what? In and of yourself? No, you don't. No, you don't. But Almighty God is the God who set everything in order as we see it today just by speaking it. I want you to, I want you to understand the power and the authority of God as He speaks. He set everything in order. I want you to realize with a wave of His hand, He holds back the waters. I love these foolish scientists who talk about the polar ice caps melting and about the waters rising. No water can rise against the hand of mighty God. The majority of land mass is under sea level. Do you know that? Who's holding it back? And you want to tell me he can't do something with you? With a blast of just one nostril, he could annihilate everything that exists. You see, my God is all powerful. And anything that is in his hand is a powerful tool. For His use. You are His workman. You are His hands. You are His mouthpiece. But let me ask you this today. How is He using you? How does He want to use you? 2 Timothy 2.15 reminds you and I of this. Be diligent to present yourself to God. Approved to God. A workman who does not need to be ashamed... Rightly dividing the word of truth. Do you want to know what it is that God has purposed you for and called you for? Let Him talk to you. Let Him speak to you. Get in His word. You'll begin to know His purpose. You'll begin to know His purpose. Diligence is a sign that people are working towards something. Do you know what we're working for in this church? We're working for a mega church. (gasps) What? I like our little church. I like it when I come here. I know everybody and everything. I don't want to walk in a place where I have to look around and say, who are these people? The mega church is the kingdom of God. For such is the kingdom of God. This is God's kingdom. 
You are God's kingdom. The mega church is as many as we can bring to God. As many as we can bring. And as many as surrender themselves to His Lordship. You know, this is fruitfulness. And this is the sign of a healthy church. And this comes out of a healthy church. Let me ask you something. On a scale of 1 to 100, what type of health rating are we scoring with God? Josh, you know all about health ratings. Boy, you just love to see them come in with that pad and that pencil, don't you, brother? You want to take that thing and say, watch it fly. But it's necessary. You know why? Because every single one of us goes into a restaurant and that's the first thing we look for. You're not going to stay somewhere where they've got an 83. No, I don't think we need to be heating here. You're looking for a score. Why? Because that means something to you. It's healthy for you. And you want to do what's best for you. You know what? God has His very best intentions for you. But you and I have got to realize we decide whether God wants to come and dine. Whether He wants to come and dine. We're the ones who give Him the opportunity to come in with that score pad and say, oh man, this is good. This is good. This is good. I think I'll sit down. And I think I'll stay a while that your joy may be full and complete and you lacking nothing. This is where God wants us to be. Diligent, working. Listen, everyone is included in this rating and everyone is needed in this work. As He said in the latter part of that Scripture we just read, let us rise up and build up. This statement was made by the people who heard Nehemiah's report. Nehemiah brought to the attention of the people the need to rebuild that which had been neglected, overlooked, and ignored. In the latter part, once they realized that, he said, then they set their hands to this good Work. Folks, there's a lot of good work that's got to be done. But it can't be done through neglect. It can't be done through ignoring. It can't be done by overlooking. And it can't be done by selfishness. So 1 Corinthians 14, 12 charges us with this. So it is with you, since you are eager to have spiritual gifts... Try to excel in gifts that build up the church. No matter what the gift. Ministry, no matter what the effect. All spiritual gifts are from God and from the Holy Spirit. You know why? When you use your gift, when you use your talent, when you use your ability, you might not have anything but the gift of gab. Hey, hey, when you use it, it builds up. When you use it, it glorifies Him. When you use it, it exhorts one another and it lifts each other up. No need to unplug. No need to step back. No need to lose heart. Because Almighty God is powerful. And the Word of God says, Greater is He who is in you than he who is in the world. We're to make Him known. We're to make Him understood. And we're to make Him evident in the church and in this world. And we can do that. And we can spiritually profit from everyone who receives their ministry. Let me ask you this. Are you ready to take your position? And are you ready to do your part? Let's pray. Mighty God, I thank you. Lord, you've come and you've spoken to us, Lord.